verses 36 to 40. Five times Christ was seen the same day that he rose, by Mary Magdalene alone in the garden, JN 2014, by the women as they were going to tell the disciples, MT 28:9, by Peter alone, by the two disciples going to Emmaus, and now at night by the eleven, of which we have an account in these verses, as also JN 2019. The great surprise which his appearing gave them. He came in among them very seasonably, as they were comparing notes concerning the proofs of his resurrection, as they thus spoke, and were ready perhaps to put it to the question whether the proofs produced amounted to evidence sufficient of their master's resurrection or no, and how they should proceed, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and put it out of question. Note, those who make the best use they can of their evidences for their comfort may expect further assurances, and that the Spirit of Christ will witness with their spirits, as Christ here witnessed with the disciples, and confirmed their testimony, that they are the children of God, and risen with Christ. Observe, 1. The comfort Christ spoke to them, Peace be unto you. This intimates in general that it was a kind visit which Christ now paid them, a visit of love and friendship. Though they had very unkindly deserted him in his sufferings, yet he takes the first opportunity of seeing them together, for he deals not with us as we deserve. They did not credit those who had seen him, therefore he comes himself, that they might not continue in their disconsolate incredulity. He had promised that after his resurrection he would see them in Galilee, but so desirous was he to see them, and satisfy them, that he anticipated the appointment and sees them at Jerusalem. Note, Christ is often better than his word, but never worse. Now his first word to them was, Peace be to you, not in a way of compliment, but of consolation. This was a common form of salutation among the Jews, and Christ would thus express his usual familiarity with them, though he had now entered into his state of exaltation. Many, when they are advanced, forget their old friends and take state upon them, but we see Christ as free with them as ever. Thus Christ would at the first word intimate to them that he did not come to quarrel with Peter for denying him and the rest for running away from him, no, he came peaceably, to signify to them that he had forgiven them, and was reconciled to them. 2. The fright which they put themselves into upon it, v. 37. They were terrified, supposing that they had seen a spirit, because he came in among them without any noise, and was in the midst of them ere they were aware. The word used, MT 1426, when they said it is a spirit, is phantasma, it is a specter, an apparition, but the word here used is pneuma, the word that properly signifies a spirit, they supposed it to be a spirit not clothed with a real body. Though we have an alliance and correspondence with the world of spirits, and are hastening to it, yet while we are here in this world of sense and matter it is a terror to us to have a spirit so far change its own nature as to become visible to us, and conversable with us, for it is something, and bodes something, very extraordinary. The great satisfaction which his discourse gave them, wherein we have 1. The reproof he gave them for their causeless fears, why are you troubled, and why do frightful thoughts arise in your hearts? v. 38. Observe here, that when at any time we are troubled, thoughts are apt to rise in our hearts that do us hurt. Sometimes the trouble is the effect of the thoughts that arise in our hearts, our griefs and fears take rise from those things that are the creatures of our own fancy. Sometimes the thoughts arising in the heart are the effect of the trouble, without our fightings and then within our fears. Those that are melancholy and troubled in mind have thoughts arising in their hearts which reflect dishonor upon God, and create disquiet to themselves. I am cut off from thy sight. The Lord has forsaken and forgotten me. That many of the troublesome thoughts with which our minds are disquieted arise from our mistakes concerning Christ. They here thought that they had seen a spirit, when they saw Christ, and that put them into this fright. We forget that Christ is our elder brother, and look upon him to be at as great a distance from us as the world of spirits is from this world, and therewith terrify ourselves. When Christ is by his spirit convincing and humbling us, when he is by his providence trying and converting us, we mistake him, as if he designed our hurt, and this troubles us. That all the troublesome thoughts which rise in our hearts at any time are known to the Lord Jesus, 
even at the first rise of them, and they are displeasing to him. He chid his disciples for such thoughts, to teach us to chide ourselves for them. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou troubled? Why do thoughts arise that are neither true nor good, that have neither foundation nor fruit, but hinder our joy in God, unfit us for our duty, give advantage to Satan, and deprive us of the comforts laid up for us? The proof he gave them of his resurrection, both for the silencing of their fears by convincing them that he was not a spirit, and for the strengthening of their faith in that doctrine which they were to preach to the world by giving them full satisfaction concerning his resurrection. Two proofs he gives them. He shows them his body, particularly his hands and his feet. They saw that he had the shape and features and exact resemblance of their master, but is it not his ghost? No, saith Christ, behold my hands and my feet, you see I have hands and feet, and therefore have a true body, you see I can move these hands and feet, and therefore have a living body, and you see the marks of the nails in my hands and feet, and therefore it is my own body, the same that you saw crucified, and not a borrowed one. He lays down this principle that a spirit has not flesh and bones, it is not compounded of gross matter, shaped into various members, and consisting of diverse heterogeneous parts, as our bodies are. He does not tell us what a spirit is, it is time enough to know that when we go to the world of spirits, but what it is not, it has not flesh and bones. Now hence he infers, it is I myself, whom you have been so intimately acquainted with, and have had such familiar conversation with, it is I myself, whom you have reason to rejoice in, and not to be afraid of. Those who know Christ are right, and know him as theirs, will have no reason to be terrified at his appearances, at his approaches. He appeals to their sight, shows them his hands and his feet, which were pierced with the nails. Christ retained the marks of them in his glorified body, that they might be proofs that it was he himself, and he was willing that they should be seen. He afterwards showed them to Thomas, for he is not ashamed of his sufferings for us, little reason then have we to be ashamed of them, or of ours for him. As he showed his wounds here to his disciples, for the enforcing of his instructions to them, so he showed them to his father, for the enforcing of his intercessions with him. He appears in heaven as a lamb that had been slain, Revelation 5 6, his blood speaks, Hebrew 12 24. He makes intercession in the virtue of his satisfaction, he says to the father, as here to the disciples, behold my hands and my feet, Zech 13 6, 7. He appeals to their touch, handle me, and see. He would not let Mary Magdalene touch him at that time, JN 2017. But the disciples here are entrusted to do it, that they who were to preach his resurrection, and to suffer for doing so, might be themselves abundantly satisfied concerning it. He bade them handle him, that they might be convinced that he was not a spirit. If there were really no spirits, or apparitions of spirits, as by this and other instances it is plain that the disciples did believe there were, this had been a proper time for Christ to have undeceived them, by telling them there were no such things, but he seems to take it for granted that there have been and may be apparitions of spirits, else what need was there of so much pains to prove that he was not one. There were many heretics in the primitive times, atheists I rather think they were, who said that Christ had never any substantial body, but that it was a mere phantasm, which was neither really born nor truly suffered. Such wild notions as these, we are told, the Valentinians and Monichis had, and the followers of Simon Magus, they were called Dogtai and Phantasiastai. Blessed be God, these heresies have long since been buried, and we know and are sure that Jesus Christ was no spirit or apparition, but had a true and real body, even after his resurrection. He eats with them, to show that he had a real and true body and that he was willing to converse freely and familiarly with his disciples, as one friend with another. Peter lays a great stress upon this, Acts 10.41 We did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, 